So there's a button. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's recording. So before I get the, uh, let, let me first of all get the um, uh, uh, the whole notion of uh, equations out of the system and tell you that what we do, uh, the essence of what we do is treat shapes as metric spaces. So if you think about the hand, if you think about my hand like that and like that, uh, from the point of view of an insect that is walking on the hand, it doesn't see much of a difference between uh, the way that I embed my hand in 3D space. It is more or less the same surface. I mean, there are a little bit of stretching and, and uh, just a little bit, but if you consider this as a, as a Riemannian manifold with the right metric, the metric doesn't, does not change much. And if you try to look at two metric spaces and try to evaluate the distance between two metric spaces, then it appears that there is a way of uh, measuring discrepancy or uh, dissimilarity between metric spaces. It's called the gromov hausdorff distance. And this is something that myself, my, me and my, I mean, my group and myself, my students and myself, uh, were engaged with, I would say, for the last uh, 15 years, okay, a uh, decade and a half. So at the end of the day, what we wanted to show is that uh, if you get a hand and a hand, the distance between a hand treated as a metric space as an another hand embedded in 3D space, uh, a different pose. Uh, so the distance between these two objects uh, would be smaller than the distance between a completely different object and a hand, okay? So we wanted to, uh, we wanted to come up with a methodology to solve this kind of a problem. And for that, we invented something. I mean, we utilized, first of all, something which is called multidimensional scaling, which is nothing but those of you who are familiar with PCA, principal component analysis, it's a really close relative of PCA if you limit it to, uh, to the linear world. Uh, then we generalized it by, uh, again, uh, an Ecole Polytechnique graduate, a student of mine, uh, Jonathan Aflalo, was able to generalize it into spectral GMDS and then um, uh, embedding into complex spaces, which we call GDD, et cetera, et cetera. What I will talk about today is at the end of this uh, evolution chain, um, and, and try to convince you that you can do interesting things by treating shapes as metric spaces. Now, when I'm saying treating shapes as metric spaces, uh, I would like to, first of all, what is, a, what is a, a manifold? If I think about a cup, then most of you should, are, are now familiar with the fact that a cup, from a topological point of view, if I just uh, treat it as a, as a, as a, as a, as a um, uh, manifold, is nothing like, but a donut, a torus. And this kind of shape is nothing but a sphere. You need to add something to it in order to make sense uh, from uh, our practical geometric point of view. This something is called the metric. So you usually add to the manifold the metric, a way of measuring distances on the manifold. Uh, it is called Riemannian if there is a way of smoothly transitioning between charts, between local ways of measuring distances on the manifold. And you say that two manifolds are, are isometric to one another if there are no stretches and tears uh, of the distances between corresponding points. So if there is one way of finding uh, for each point here, the corresponding point there, uh, there is no distortion uh, between the distances between points, okay? So this is a Riemannian manifold. And the question is, what can you do in order to uh, translate the idea of comparing between these two abstract spaces into something that I can compute in algebra using regular algebra. And let me just, as I promised you, take the uh, equations out of the system. Uh, what we do, I mean, if I define the metric to the surface, then I have uh, a metric defined on the surface. With the metric, I can define the Laplacian. It's called the Laplace Beltrami operator. It's a positive, it's a semi-positive definite uh, operator that I can decompose into eigenfunctions and eigenvalues. And it appears that if I use two different metrics for the same manifold, then the eigenfunctions that they both of them generate can interact with one another. And it appears that, th that this interaction creates a signature for me. And if I pick my uh, metric uh, way of measuring distances wisely, I can, uh, I can have these, these inner products serve as a signature for the surface. So if I do it for one surface and then I do it for the other, then these uh, interactions between these uh, uh, eigenspaces is basically a signature by which I can compare surfaces. Um, so again, if I compute 
sorry, if I compute the G's and the G tildes for these surfaces, and if these two surfaces are similar, then what would happen is that I would get similar matrices, infinite matrices, if I look at the continuous space, uh, but still matrices uh, that I can compare with using, I don't know, whatever comparison metric you can think of. Now, this is the essence uh, that I would try to communicate of comparing between metric spaces. But before we go there, let me let us ask the question of how do I, I actually capture a geometric structure and fit it into a computer? So uh, a short story, when I came to the Technion, I got a grant. This grant was, I don't know, I could hold about three PhD students or buy a 3D system as 3D capturing system, which is a system by which I can capture the geometry of the world. Uh, what I did is uh, hire three PhD students. I mean, students are obviously more important than, uh, than uh, infrastructure. And I told one of the students to build a system like that. So what you see here is basically a stereo-based system. You can think about it as two eyes, one eye and, uh, and another eye. And the computer is, uh, doing, is solving what is known as the correspondence problem and uh, reconstructing the geometry of the objects that, that it looks at, okay? In fact, here, th these are not two eyes, but rather a projector and an eye. But from the point of view of the geometry that you have to solve, it's more or less the same. So if I would have had two, uh, two cameras here, uh, then this would have been, uh, sorry, then this would have been my stereo system. Uh, what happened is, and this, these are the 3D reconstruction that we got. What happened is that we uh, licensed this technology to a company called InVision and InVision was acquired by Intel. And in fact, the, the uh, real sense sensors that uh, you can now buy off the shelf are based on our technology. The first one was definitely based on our technology. The next one was based on a technology of another company called TYZX, but uh, we, will, we actually got over the technology and now we are making it more accurate by using our technology. And I don't know if you heard about the leader, um, uh, the leader system that Intel is now, um, is now selling. It's also based on some ideas that we have. So this is how you capture geometric objects. Now, the moment you take a system like that, it looks, I don't know, um, 50 centimeters by 20 centimeters by 20 centimeters, and you pack it into a three millimeter uh, system that looks like that, okay? So that you could, you should be able to fit it and squeeze it into your uh, telephone or your uh, screen, then a lot of the resolution goes away and you have to improve it. And the question is, how should we improve the resolution that we get? Um, and the answer, is resorting, uh, this is our competitors at the time, this is the uh, Microsoft Kinect, this is how big and energetic it was, and this is how small and tiny our system was. And uh, I always like to say that when you optimize in the academic world, you optimize for the accuracy and the time. If you, if you push it into the industry, you also have to optimize for the cost. Okay, so this is how it looked like, uh, I, I would say about five or six years ago. So, we have our uh, system and now we are capturing geometric data. And the question is, uh, how can I improve the data that I see? So what you see here at the top is the output of the Intel RealSense uh, camera. And now the only thing that we will use in order to improve the data is look at the image formation model, the most simple model you can think of. And this is uh, the fact that the intensity image that we look at is equal to the inner product between the light source direction and the normal of the surface. Okay, this is called shading uh, Lambertian image uh, formation model. If you use this model in order to improve the, uh, the geometry that the camera is producing for you, again, using the fact that I know the image and I'm try trying to improve on the normals, then what you get is you get, get the smile back to this morph, to this doll or the fingernail if I will play it further on, you can see that now you can see the fingernail and before that uh, it looks completely noisy. So again, top is the output of the system, bottom is the improved version. Uh, and what we use is something which is called, uh, is it called axiomatic model. Okay, you have some axioms by which shape uh, the color uh, image that you have seen on the left is the, is the, is the set of normals. And what you basically have is uh, using a, an image formation model that tells us how physics is being translated from, uh, from the world into pixels. 
and then trying to invert it in order to get back a better resolution of the image. Okay, and, and you can see that indeed we can get rid of the, a lot of the noise. We call it noise because uh, because the, the, this happens. Uh, now this is an axiomatic model. This is something that we have been busy doing. I would say in the last. Uh, uh, three or four decades. This is how computer vision uh, was was operating uh, in the last uh, five centuries. Now, it's, it would not be a surprise to tell you that about uh, 10 years ago, there was a disruptive um, revolution in the field uh, in the sense that uh, networks, what we know today as uh, deep neural networks and convolutional neural, network, neural networks took over the whole idea of axioms. So instead of getting the simplest explanation of how an image is being uh, uh, is being generated um, or being uh, uh, being uh, generated in the real world, what we had is a lot of examples, and from these examples we had to reconstruct back the image. So instead of having an axiomatic method for, sh for shape from shading, now what we have is a network. Uh, a set of convolutions that are working on our data and from and, and the, at the end we get something which is better or some interpretation or classification now this revolution uh, can be uh, can be uh, uh, can be uh, the result of several uh, disruptive technologies that came that came about one of them is the introduction of uh, gpus of uh, parallel of uh, really high computational power that can, can work in parallel on many, many uh, data instances. Another one is the fact that uh, a lot of data was starting to become available. So it's not only the uh, computing power, it's also the data power. And when you put both of them together on the technology from the 60s and some uh, advances that were uh, being uh, pushed uh, by three people that I will mention in a moment, then at the end of the day, you get something that looks like a sequence of layers by which you operate on your signal. And at the end of the day, you get something good, something which would probably be as at least as good as the uh, idea that, uh, that I'm showing you here. So the question came about, and if you have any question, please feel free to, uh, to stop me in the middle. So the question came about of how should we throw away everything we learned about um, axiomatic methods and just move into deep learning. And my answer uh, at the end of the, uh, this talk, I hope that I will be able to convince you, is that no. In fact, using this kind of measures, uh, you can shift the learning mechanism into something which is called unsupervised or semi-supervised uh, learning, which is taking every, everything we knew from the axiomatic world. Don't worry too much about the numerics, about how optimization is done, because the, the network optimization is, is somebody something that somebody done for you, and then you get the same results. Oh, good. Let good. me just uh, show you how uh, this uh, system was used. So this is a company, uh, Faceit, that was acquired by Apple in uh, uh, 2015, and what it does is just looking at this guy's face and uh, generating an avatar in real time. So it works in real time as well. Uh, and this is the new uh, sensor of Intel, I will jump over it. So uh, the revolution came uh, by three uh, researchers, Jan Lecun, uh, Jeffrey Hinton, and uh, Joshua Bengio, that basically claimed for many years that you can do much better than what people are now doing in computer vision by uh, looking at something which is called convolutional neural, neural network. AlexNet, ImageNet, no matter how you call it, at the end of the day, you look at each and every piece of the image, and you uh, operate with the same linear shift invariant operator and you create uh, a sequence of other, let's call it feature spaces, and then you aggregate them somehow, max pooling, min pooling, ReLU. And at the end of the day, you have something which is called the regression layer that would classify the letter that you're looking at. Would, would it be one, two, three, A, B, or C, or improve the image so you don't have to have a regression layer at the end. And the question is, how can we, how can we harness, how can we use this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, tools in order to attack the classical um, geometric problem where there is no linear shift invariant property? I mean, when I'm looking at a surface, I don't have this nice property of being able to operate in the same manner at two places. Any questions? Okay, next. 
Uh, if we go back to a famous French mathematician, the, uh, theoretician, philosopher, uh, uh, philosopher uh, René Descartes, who said that uh, we could actually use algebraic method in order to describe geometry and vice versa. So if you're familiar with the Cartesian coordinate, you probably uh, heard about his results. And the question is, how can we do that? So let's try to, uh, first of all, use neural networks in order to solve a very simple and uh, basic problem, which is try to reconstruct the function so that the uh, absolute value of the gradient of the function would be one almost everywhere. Try to find the smoothest function. So in, in, in this sense, we are looking for uh, something which is called the viscosity solution. Um, since the viscosity theory uh, originated in France, I hope that you at least heard about it. Otherwise, you can think about it as the smoothest possible solution. In fact, what we are, uh, if you solve it, it appears that what you solve is a distance function from a given point, let's call it um, uh, x0, which is, uh, which is at which I have the data, okay? So if you think about uh, a line and uh, you have a point at which you know that uh, u is equal to zero and you are trying to reconstruct a function whose gradient is equal to one, what you'll have is a function that goes up with a constant slope to one side and with a constant slope to the other. And this is nothing but a distance function. Again. In, in English, Xavier. Should they shoot Xavier? Let me try to do that. Um, so again, if you have any questions, that just unmute yourself and ask the question. If possible in English, because my French is not so good. So the question is, how do I solve such a question of, uh, of, um, um, of finding an optimal solution? And what people have been doing is using, and, and myself as well, is solving, is using something which is called fast marching method or fast sweeping methods or uh, whatever you like uh, with some success. And, I mean, we have been able to find viscosity solvers for this kind of operation, and we have been able to do it quite fast but it was, was, was either fast or accurate. We couldn't get both. And the question was how to do, how to uh, get both. And the answer was in fact, and if you look at the evolution, then on regular grids computing this equation, uh, it took about between five and 10 years to jump between uh, uh, the different accuracy. And if you look at triangulated uh, domains, at uh, domains at which there is no regular shape to how uh, the grid that approximate the problem uh, are, um, are connected together, then there are actually only two solutions. One of them is the fast marching method uh, of uh, Jamie Setian and myself uh, that we published about 22 years ago. And the other one uh, is a uh, result by Suratsky, Suratsky, et cetera, uh, who had uh, what they called uh, exact geo, they solved the exact geometric problem. And this is a problem, this is a solution that was suggested in 87, 1987. And if you think about it, it is practically uh, an order of eight square algorithm where h is the distance, sorry, where h is the distance between two grid points. So the larger the power of the h, the better the algorithm. And the question was, can we in linear time, uh, can we assume that you have n, some, n, n such points, can we have a linear or quasi linear solver that would get h square accuracy? Okay, so the a square r accuracy was n squared complex. And the answer was uh, training a network that would look at the local, we call it stencil, the local support of the grid. And with uh, this network, we could actually get uh, a second order. This is a work by um, uh, Moshe Lichtenstein, Gautam Pai, who is now spending his postdoc in a Polytechnic in Paris, uh, and, and myself, uh, where we have shown that you can, in fact, use um, um, use uh, a network in order to get really, really close, close to the ground solution, the, to the accurate uh, solution. And this is how it looks like on uh, surfaces. So a network, and this is the simplest way of looking at a network. There is no convolution, there is nothing. The only thing you do is plug and play the update scheme. And the update scheme that you updated um, uh, is nothing but a network that you train on regimes where you know the solution. So it would be either a sphere that you sample really, really uh, densely without any regular connection between the points or um, I don't know, some plane in, in which you know the data, which you know the, the analytic solution of the problem. 
Okay, let me take you to another uh, domain. And this is the question of how to classify geometric shapes. And here the problem was that uh, we encountered a solution uh, by Hao Su and, and his colleagues from about three years ago that was giving really interesting, I wouldn't say great, but good uh, ways of classifying between, uh, between shapes. And in a moment, I will describe to you what this method is doing. But before that, let me tell you how we used to classify shapes, I would say 120 years ago. If not we, this is a royal we, okay? The idea was if you have a set of points that is describing a shape, what you need to do in order to uh, classify the shape is compute moments. So the average of all the points, assuming that they are uh, uniformly distributed over your shape, would be the center of mass. The, um, uh, I mean, the inner product between the set of points would be between the set, set of points and, and themselves. And then summing them up would be the first order, the second order moment, which is the rotation of uh, the, the main axis of inertia and the second one. And, and this is nothing but computing the moments of, the, of this uh, set of points. And in the limit, you can show that uh, you can reconstruct back your uh, data from this set of moments. Okay, so why am I telling you that? This is an old way of, uh, of uh, class of act actually reconstructing shapes. And in fact, you can do it for classification. The reason I'm telling you that is because there was another way of uh, classifying shapes and this is called PointNet. What PointNet was doing was looking at, uh, uh, I mean, what the network is doing is accepting the coordinate of each and every point in 3D space, then training a network to lift the, these three numbers into a thousand dimensional space, 1024, but let's call it thousand. And then when you do it for each and every point, you look at the vectors that describe each and, that describe each and every point, and you pull down, uh, I mean, you look at the maximum or the average of, all, of each and every coordinate, and you create one vector out of all the points. So if you have 30,000 points, at the end of the day, you get one vector of 1,000 uh, numbers. And this would be the uh, vector by which you classify your shapes, okay? And this is called PointNet, and it became really popular. Uh, the origin is Stanford, and everybody was using it, and, and we didn't understand why it works. I mean, why such a oversimplistic method work? And if you think about the previous idea of uh, lifting into moments and lifting into, uh, into this kind of strange space, then you can think that there might be a relation between the two. Now, network find it really difficult to multiply numbers. I mean, the number of layers that you need in a network in order to multiply two numbers is log the representation space of, the, of, the, of each and every number. So what we said, if we know everything about moments and we know that this network operates well, let's try to help that. And this is work by, um, um, by uh, uh, Joseph Rivlin, uh, more Joseph Rivlin, uh, Alonso Virin and myself. And what we did is we replaced the uh, X, Y, Z by let's help it with just the ingredients of the second order moments. So now in order to get the second order moments, the only thing that the network needs to do is just sum numbers. It doesn't have to multiply anymore. And it appears that with this really simple change of um, uh, input, um, of input, let's call it feature lifting or feature changing, I can squeeze the network and make it much more efficient. I mean, if we look at the point net and, and the suggested one, then with half the memory, we get better results, which is, considered to be good, okay? And again, if you also look at the neighboring points, then it becomes a little bit more interesting. And even there we win. We win in both memory, I mean, time that it would take you to run the network as well as the accuracy. So having in mind uh, the axiomatic method can really help you in deciphering problems. Now, I don't have much time to go, on, and you should tell me how much do I have to go into uh, some other stuff and I don't want to scare you too much. Uh, but let me just tell you that what you could do with, uh, with this kind of architectures is take a shape, let's call the shape Q, and a partial way of partial um, uh, way of looking at the shape in a different pose. And then what you can do is train the network using something which we call the encoder, or it's called encoder decoder architecture in order to reconstruct the new pose of the old object. Okay, so 
This is how the ground truth was looking like, and this is what the output of the network. And this is a work by Oshri Halimi, Emmanuel, uh, um, uh, Ido Emmanuel, and, and other students, okay? Um, now, something which is really interesting, in fact, uh, one of your professor, Max Ustyanikov, it, and, and uh, some others, uh, introduced an interesting way of, uh, of um, comparing between shapes, which is called functional maps. I don't want to teach you about functional maps. I think that, uh, that uh, Max could uh, teach you much better than me. Uh, but let me just tell you that this is a way of uh, looking at, at your shapes in an analog way so that you will be able at the end of the day uh, try to uh, match between shapes using, um, um, using the, the interaction between eigenspaces that are uh, defined on one shape and on the other. Okay, so you have eigenspace on one shape and you have an eigenspace on the other. And then by trying to somehow rotate and match the, these eigenspaces, you can reconstruct the connection between the two uh, different shapes. Uh, what we did now, what uh, an interesting uh, work by, uh, by um, Orly Tani uh, was to translate this idea into a neural network. And the way he did it is he uh, used something which is called shot. This is assume that you have your shape and on each, at each and every point you inflate a sphere so that it intersects the uh, boundary of your shape, the uh, surface of the shape. And you accumulate uh, the number of um, uh, sections in the shape that it, uh, that it intersects and you create some sort of uh, a vector of 300 numbers that for each and every point on the shape. So 300 numbers, think about it as 300 colors by which you color your shape. And this is a feature. And when you do it to a different shape, if, it, if the shape is similar, then you should have similar colors uh, to the shape. But now, when you project it into the eigenspaces, into the corresponding eigenspaces that we denote here as uh, psi and phi, uh, then you get something by which you can extract the permutation that you project, that, you, uh, that allow you to move from one shape to the other. And the way that, um, uh, we try to improve that. I mean, not we, Litani try to improve, improve that is to blend somehow the, the colors uh, using a neural network, training it with the, with the fact that he knows how each and every uh, point is being translated from shape S to shape Q. So he gets a lot of shapes uh, for which the data, uh, the, the mapping between S, between S and Q is known. And he's training the network so that it would blend at the end of the day the features that would give him the best, uh, the best uh, permutation matrix. Now, one of my students, Sri Halimi, said, look, this is nice, but we don't really have the, uh, the luxury of having the, the correct connection between the shapes. Can we revisit the whole idea of doing it in a supervised manner? And what she did is to compute the distance from each and every point on S to the rest of the point on S. This is something that you can do offline. You can do the same for all the uh, queues. And then what you try to do is optimize for a permutation that would map your interdistances point on, in this case, Y, to the interdistances on X. So this is a semi-supervised or an unsupervised way of learning uh, the neural network that would take the shot, that would take the uh, primitive features and translate them into something that the uh, functional maps can digest at the end of the day. So this is an idea of how to leave the convolution space into, uh, into um, uh, different spaces and at the end of the day work on really thin, uh, on really small numbers of, uh, of, uh, of uh, input to the network, in this case 300, and when you have only 300 numbers, it's no longer a megapixel that you need to operate on. Okay. Um, obviously, it performed better than uh, others, and it could handle uh, missing parts, and uh, it could actually be uh, uh, just learn on two shapes that you give it, and we were really happy with that at the time. But the thing that we were not happy is the fact is the fact that neural network tell you that you should always ignore, you should not look at uh, features, you should learn the features. Don't uh, give some shot uh, feed you with the features. And this is uh, a question that um, uh, one of my students, Amit Litani, uh, uh, Amit Bracha got, and in a moment we will get to it. Now you should tell me how much time do I have? 
uh, so that I will be able to uh, fit it into reasonable. Uh... Yeah, Jerome. You have 20 minutes. 20 minutes, okay. Um, so I promised you that if you look at the same shape using two different ways of measuring distance, then you can do something clever. You can use, uh, you can either decompose the Laplacian operator, it would give you a natural um, um, eigenspace with respect of one metric and a, a different eigenspace with, the, with respect to a different metric. And we all know the intuitive way of measuring distances. Let me teach you a different one. Say that I would like to have a scale invariant way of measuring distances along these two curves. Uh, the distance of the, the, the uh, way to measure distances would be, for example, the change of the uh, the change of the um, uh, tangent. Okay, so think about how much you have to turn the wheel on a road that you are driving at, and it doesn't matter if this uh, curve is uh, small or large. The only thing you care about is how much you turn the wheel. So you should know that uh, the change in angle is nothing but uh, the curvature, the one over the radius of the oscillating circle at each and every point, times the uh, Euclidean distance. Okay, this is something that we that you should uh, be familiar with. Otherwise, just refresh your geometry, and this is this is well known. How can we take it to surfaces? So this is a well-known geometry, uh, scale invariant uh, geometry, and uh, we could actually work with it. Or in, in fact, it's a, it's a quasi-metric if, if we think about points at which the curvature is equal to zero, but let's ignore it for a moment. Um, now, let me go back to surfaces. On surfaces, we have uh, the Gaussian curvature. Okay, it's the multiplication of the two principal curvatures, the structure of the second fundamental form. And we have a metric. A metric is a way of uh, translating the UV parameterization that define in this case uh, two-dimensional surface in three-dimensional space. So the metric would just be a way of translating the change in x, y, and z coordinates uh, into my arc length. And if the x, y, and z are function of u and v, this is a parametric surface, then in the center I would get this uh, affine matrix that would multiply my vu and dv into something that I could call arc length, okay? So these are the metric coefficients. Uh, any of you who learned a little bit uh, of physics uh, know the GIJ uh, notation. If not, just know that this is how the metric looks like. So it's a way of translating, uh, it's a multiplication of the two Jacobians. It's the, it's the way of uh, uh, taking the du and dv and writing it uh, so that I would be able to measure distances and surfaces. Everything is nice and, and clear, but what happens when I would like to have a scale invariant uh, uh, metric, okay? What happens if, if now I don't care any much about the Euclidean distance, but I would care about the scale invariant one? And the answer is simple. What I need to do is modulate my metric by the Gaussian curvature. Now, the Gaussian curvature has a really nice property, uh, and this property is that it is uh, invariant to how I embed my surface in, in 3D space. So if the length was uh, invariant to how I embed my surface in 3D space, then multiplying the metric with the Gaussian curvature would keep this property. Okay, so let's, let's do that. If I now multiply, and let's take the absolute value here, so I have a quasi metric. So if I multiply my metric with the Gaussian curvature, what I get is a scale invariant uh, metric. So this is how you generate a scale invariant metric. And in fact, Dan Raviv and uh, Jonathan Aflalo got the best paper award in one of the uh, top journals in the field of actually introducing a new metric that one could work with, a scale invariant metric. So now let's plug this metric into the uh, Laplace Beltrami operator. So instead of having the regular Laplacian or the regular Laplace Beltrami operator, what we'll do is we add the, uh, the new metric. So this is the plus and this is the trommy and we have this operator that we can decompose. And now the decomposition would yield uh, scale invariant vectors, okay? So if these are the, this is now painting the eigenvectors. So the numbers here correspond to uh, scalar values. And this is how, this is how the uh, second eigenvalue would look like. The first one would be zero, would be a constant. The second one would have, would look like that, et cetera, et cetera. And these are the eigenvectors of the scale invariant metric, okay? So you can see that very, uh, I mean, after I would say one, two, three, four, five, after the seven one, 
uh, you would start seeing uh, events happening at places where you have a high curvature. Why? Because we multiply the metric by the curvature. So this is where a lot of uh, interesting stuff, stuff is happening. So from this uh, metric, I could generate eigenfunctions. From this metric, I could uh, generate different eigenfunctions. And now it appears that if I now take these two eigenfunctions from which uh, I generate, uh, uh, each one generated for the same shape, with different eigen, uh, with different metric, what I get is a matrix. Now, instead of comparing these shapes, which is a different, difficult uh, problem when you pose them differently in 3D space, what I need to do now is uh, compare these, uh, these, these matrices, okay? So these matrices at the top correspond to these horses and these matrices at the bottom correspond to these ladies. And now in order to say that this lady corresponds to this one or is uh, similar to this one, what you need to do is just take this matrix and compare it to this one. Now, I was cheating a little bit. Uh, I was cheating a little bit because when you take an operator and you decompose it, uh, what you get is you get your eigenvectors up to a sign, okay? So you have the sign ambiguity. And it's in numerical sense, it, it's even worse because these objects are not exact isometries. So what you have is that if you have uh, similar eigenvalues, then what you can have is local rotations of the eigenspace and you need to resolve it, okay? And in order to resolve it, uh, I will show you something interesting. So this is how it operates. I mean, you, you, can, you can obviously split each point here correspond to a dog in a different pose. Each, each green point correspond to a person in a different pose and the same goes for the horses. And when you try to measure the distances between the corresponding matrices, what you get is really nice clustering of these objects. So you would, see, you would say it is obvious, but it also works for very similar objects, like uh, these are synthetic shapes of, uh, of uh, humans, and these are real scans of humans uh, taken from uh, the Faust database, a German database. So you can see that uh, translating each and every object into my matrix and then comparing between these matrices actually allows me to uh, split, to differ between the different subjects. So it has some uh, truth into it, but again, there is cheating going on here. And this is the fact that I need to work really hard in order to somehow compensate for these sign, ambigu sign ambiguities and the uh, fact that I have local rotations that I have to, uh, to deal with. So going back uh, to uh, slides going two slides back, what I had is my shot that is being fed into a neural network that was blending the features somehow so that the inner product with the eigenfunctions gave me something that I can work with in order to extract back the, uh, the um, permutation matrix, the way of translating X into Y. But now I would like to revisit this idea. And revisiting is, it would be saying, look, you feed the eigenfunctions with respect to the regular one here, but let's treat the eigenfunctions, the scale invariant eigenfunctions as, as my other features, okay? So if I use the scale invariant eigenfunctions, let me just go back to this one. If I now use the scale invariant eigenfunctions as my features, then what I need to do is somehow rotate them so that they would fit the eigenfunctions, the scale invariant eigenfunctions of the other shape. So now my, network is no longer a network. What I need to do is rotate my features of shape X to the features of shape Y. So this is uh, this kind of a matrix that I have to apply on these eigenfunctions so that they would fit these eigenfunctions. And if I, if I solve that, if I solve that, then what I get uh, is, um, uh, what I would get is, um, uh, is, is a problem that is an optimization problem using, um, using the back propagation trick of the neural network. I mean, just the mechanism, it is an axiomatic method. So I'm getting two shapes, X and Y, and now I'm computing the eigenfunctions uh, with, respect to the regular, uh, with respect to the regular metric and the scale invariant one. And I'm training my network, my network, I'm training my structure so that it would find the best rotation for the size uh, so that they would fit into the, uh, the, into the files, okay? And the way of measuring success would be exactly as before, the intergeodesics of Y should be equal to the intergeodesics on X. So I'm trying to find a permutation matrix 
in the space, uh, in the spectral space that would try to fit uh, these two eigen uh, set of eigenspaces. Okay, and this was working really nice. We got really uh, nice alignment. So if before these were corresponding eigenfunctions, and you can see that they are different. I mean, the colors, the different colors indicate that they are different. And after you can see that uh, the fitting is really is nice, is done really nicely. And uh, this is how it works for, uh, this is before and after. And uh, you could see that it works really nice. But what is even more important is, is that it can actually give us uh matching between and and uh, uh recognize actually recognizing which shape is which under different poses of the shape okay now in the last 10 minutes that i have um i would try to talk about a related yet different problem and this is the problem of uh, trying to reconstruct back a face uh from a two-dimensional image okay and um let me try to do it fast and squeeze two topics into this lecture. So the idea uh, was actually led by Elad Richardson, a master student of mine, and Matan Sel, a PhD student. And the idea was that uh, if I'm looking at a two-dimensional image and I would like to extract the three-dimensional geometry, the uh, surface of the shape, what I need to do is somehow learn, um, feed the network that would be able to learn, give it geometry and give it photometry, give it the image, and let the network uh, do the learning and, and extract back the data. The problem is that I don't ha have such huge databases. It's really expensive to get to acquire the geometry of many faces. Think that uh, I need millions of them if I have million parameters in my network. And the way to overcome that was to use a synthesizer, which is called 3DMD. It's a linear synthesizer of faces. And uh, with this linear synthesizer, what we can do is we can uh, synthesize all the faces that you see over here. So these are the geometries and these are the corresponding uh, photometries. So we have the image and we have the geometry. And with that, we can actually train a network. So I can uh, synthesize by just tuning. Uh, now I'm living in the linear space, which is due to Vetter and Blunt, and it's called the 3D, 3DMM model. Now, because it's a linear space, you can see that all these, uh, most of these people look as if they are uh, after a stroke. Uh, but once I have the geometry, I can play with the pose in 3D space. I can play with the lighting directions, and I can also play with the background. I hope that uh, it goes through Zoom. And if I have all this data, then I can have the uh, new question of given a face, can I create a network that would reconstruct the face? And in fact, you can. What you see over here, uh, is, is the face that I'm reconstructing. Now, this is nice, but the story is not as simple as you can see over here. In fact, the reconstruction is done to the linear space, to the really smooth version that you see over here. So what we do in order to extract back, so this is uh, when you look at the Caprio space, this is what you'd get. You get a smooth space that would capture the main features of the space, but you would not have the fine details. The fine details is something that you can capture, for example, with a shape from shading problem that I've shown you at the beginning of the lecture. So if now you use the, um, uh, the uh, shape from shading axiomatic model in order to add back the fine features, you'd get really nice looking uh, reconstruction of the data of the Caprio space. Now, once we had this model, and this is the first one that we presented in 3DV uh, four years ago, uh, we asked ourselves, wait, 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 if I have an axiomatic model, why can't I uh, train a network to uh, do the job for me? So this was the, the second one. And in fact, we got really nice results by training a network so that the penalty would be semi-supervised, would be the shape from shading model. Now we said, okay, but why do we need to transfer through a linear model in between? I mean, if we have the beginning and the end, let's do everything uh, end to end. And when we did that, we actually got really nice results. Let me just jump to uh, results that we are getting today. And this is how the results look like. So this is the input to the system. It's a two-dimensional uh, surface. And this would be the output. Let me just jump ahead. Uh, this is how the output lo would look like. So it can digest and you can actually see the really fine structures that are being uh, captured by the shape from shading penalty. Uh, and this is how it looks like over here. And this is how it looks like over there. I mean, you can actually see the wrinkles. Now there is also obviously a, uh, some delicate um, balance between accuracy 
and stability. So if you'll see uh, many papers today are showing these examples and where, when somebody uh, has a beard, obviously would fail. Now, obviously it would fail because we were not trained for beards, but if you train for beards, then you would probably do uh, as good as modern. But the idea of synthesizing data and then using it and then coupling it with an axiomatic method is I think a, a winning combination. Before I finish, uh, and now uh, this is just a new way of, of uh, synthesizing data. This is, a, um, this is a paper by Gil Shamai and Ron Slosberg uh, in which we used GAN, Generative Adversarial Network in order to capture geometries so that they would not, not look like as if they are after a stroke. This is how uh, the different synthesized. So these objects, this subject are not real. They are synthesized from the data that we learned from. And if uh, we feed each and every face into a face recognition uh, system and uh, plot and uh, embed the distances between these faces into, uh, into a plane, then what you see here is that the real faces are accumulated in, I would say, probably ethnic groups. So these would be Caucasian, Afro-Americans, and Asians. And, uh, and uh, if you look at the uh, generative adversarial network synthesized objects, they would look I mean, the probability would look very similar to the full probability of faces in real world. However, if you use the linear model, it would give you some sort of a Gaussian. Now, obviously you can work with the linear uh, model and shape it so that at the end of the day, uh, it would fit the true distribution of faces, but this is something that you need to work on. With the GAN example, you can actually have a network that would do the job for you. Um, now, before I finish, let me just tell you of an interesting unrelated project that we did with a bunch of uh, physicians, MDs. Uh, so this is Gil Shamai, you have uh, Binnenbaum is now in Boston uh, doing this, uh, he's, a, he's a physician, medical doctor. Another medical doctor, Reed, Ziv Gil uh, was the head of the uh, neck and head surgery in Rambam. And Ron Schlossberg and Gil are two PhD students of mine. And what we did is the following. If you look at uh, biopsies uh, of tissues when you try to analyze uh, breast cancer, then the first thing that, a phys that the physicians are doing are coloring these slides with something which is called uh, hematoxylin A and eosin. Okay, this is the simplest and most cheap way of coloring these slides. Now, if um, a pathologist is looking at these slides and is saying, uh, if there is determining if there is a cancer, if there is no cancer, and also how severe is this cancer. But in order to treat the cancer, you also need to understand uh, some other factors of the cancer. For example, what kind of hormones it is binding to. And for that, usually what they do is they color the, um, uh, they color the uh, neighboring slides uh, with other kinds of colors, which is called immunohistochemistry. Uh, and uh, at the third stage, I actually do some DNA analysis. And the question, now this is a more expensive and more, and more tedious process. And the question that we asked ourselves is, can we actually look at the first simple image that was stained by H&E and determine what would be the result of uh, coloring it with uh, immunohistochemistry? Here it's um, uh, ER positive, ER negative, I mean, uh, estrogen, progesterone positive or negative. And we would like to, without coloring, using this expensive immun immunoester chemistry coloring, uh, determine according to the structure, to the geometry of the shape, what is going on here. Now, if you talk to a pathologist, he will, talk, he will tell you, look, you cannot do that. You cannot do that because the uh, physiology of the cell is something that you have to look at. And, and there is no way that you can look at the regular image and, and conclude uh, some, other, um, some other conclusions. It would be like, and this is a, an analogy that I heard uh, so many often, it would be like uh, bringing you into a closed door and telling you that you can see through the door. So what we said, uh, we, we have a lot of data. Let's try to uh, figure out if the machine can actually tell us this, uh, this information. What we realized is that if you look at the original data, for more than 30% of the subjects, you can determine what would be the ER, I mean, this, this uh, kind of uh, result that you would have been able to predict, coloring it with uh, the immunohistochemistry coloring. So for 30%, you can, uh, with a certainty of more than 97%, predict 
what would be the uh, outcome of the coloring. In fact, you can, uh, if you also introduce the uh, common uh, practitioner, I mean, the common pathologist to the game, uh, the machine would probably be do as good as the uh, common practitioner, okay? And this is an interesting initial result. We are now trying to push it forward. I have a team of about, uh, I would say, uh, seven students and, and uh, engineers that are working on that. We, I mean, it's not me, it's uh, Gil Shamayn myself. And uh, the results are really encouraging. And in fact, you can uh, also show that in the connection tissues, there is evidence to the cancer. So even without seeing any cells, just the connecting, the, just the connecting tissues, uh, you can actually see evidence for the cancer. Uh, it, made, uh, it made us locally famous here in Israel. Uh, and I think that I'm almost done with my uh, time. So thank you for your attention. If you have any questions whatsoever, I'm here. So thank you very much for this very uh, interesting and impressive talk. Um, I ask the students for questions. Other students or other people in the audience? This is the problem with Zoom usually. Yeah, it's the same for class. You, you give class and uh, every time you ask something from uh, So what I do audience, class, you get nothing. is say that uh, whoever asks an interesting question would get one credit point. Okay, and does it work? It works. <laughs> it works. But, but the same people are always asking this. So I have a guy who accumulated, I don't know, 20 points already. Yeah. He would not have to go to the final. Hmm. Yes, I have a question. Sure. Yes, please, my friend. Yes. Um, on the slides you, you presented, uh, where you showed uh, the curves and uh, how you match them, uh, I thought uh, maybe it could be useful to use the time distance uh, to compute the, the matching uh, the two the two shapes, the two curves. So, yeah, so you could do Wasserstein distance, you could do Gromov Wasserstein. In fact, uh, this is something that uh, we try to do. When, when I'm saying Gromov Hausdorff, um, the, the Hausdorff is a really, um, let's call it outlier sensitive measure. So uh, immediately what we move is to gromov wassenstein distance. And then this is what we are actually trying to approximate. Um, yeah, you are absolutely right. It's a completely legitimate way of, actually this is the way of, uh, of comparing between shapes. Um, Again, I didn't go into the essence of the gromov hausdorff distance, which was actually occupying our minds all the time, because this is how Gromov saw a way of comparing between uh, metric spaces. But what we did is uh, we translated, I mean, when, when trying to approximate it numerically, we practically used the L2. And with the L2, you, you can actually show that you are appro approximating the gromov wasserstein rather than the gromov hausdorff distance. OK, thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, sorry, I had the question in the, the chat. Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> yes. So that was um, how do optimal transport helps uh, in uh, geometric learning? In particular, you just uh, talked about uh, Blaster-Stein uh, metrics, and um, I'm more interested into the computational aspect of this. Like, um, you use Synchron uh, entropy algorithm. Um, how does it look like in terms of uh, time to compute, um, to tackle big problems, etc.? Okay, so uh, the magic answer would be that you can solve everything. So uh, if you're really interested in that, I, I suggest that you look into Gershon Polanski uh, papers in which he shows that if you're trying to, uh, that, that the philosophy of um, uh, information bottleneck uh, in neural network is is a way of looking at um, at uh, transport uh, at earth moving distance algorithms. Okay, at earth moving distance problems. In fact, if you think of a network, it would be like uh, translating one um, metric, one uh, let's call it a probability space into a different probability space. And obviously, if the network is efficient. Then, uh, then this is what it would do. And, and we know that networks in some sense are efficient. Uh, now, if you ask me if there is any, any um, rigorous theoretical link between the two, not that I'm aware of. Um, 
beside treating, and, and even worse than that, uh, the moment uh, somebody is talking about information bottleneck, the next day, um, uh, some professor from, uh, from the other side of the world would connect all the layers uh, and would immediately show you that he gets better results if you completely destroy the, the, uh, this kind of philosophy. So um, from a, from a, from a yeah. box point of view, you can treat the input and the output as two different uh, statistical spaces. Uh, probability, probabilistic spaces, and for that I suggest that you look into uh, Volansky uh, papers. Uh, from and, and it relates obviously to the transform problem. Um, but again, this is this is too abstract for me to answer. I don't I don't know. Okay, if I, I was going to to ask about more specifically um, nowadays uh, machine learning seems to to have taken the um, a love into uh, optimal transport techniques. Like we, we've seen uh, Wasserstein GAN, uh, Wasserstein anything, Wasserstein neural networks everywhere. And my question was more like, I had the feeling that it didn't improve a lot. And at the same time, um, it looked like that advanced techniques using manifold learning were doing a lot better, like TSNE and stuff like that. So I was wondering if, if optimal transport was really that interesting for machine learning and whether it should be whether we should try to look for more advanced techniques in the field of mathematics around manifolds etc or if we can combine the both it's a naive question so so again i, I would give a naive answer um i would say that you need to be renaissance people in order to tackle the problem so in that sense learn to the last bit of what uh, um, uh, i don't know monk and terovich uh, formulations are giving you and then if you can put it on a network and compute it efficiently um, you should do you should do good now let's go one step back and, and ask our, ourselves uh, how did uh, earth moving distance did <clears throat> even before we had networks I mean, we had the problem of computing them efficiently, uh, and then we uh, projected them. Uh, in fact, uh, Gabriel Ferre from, from your school is, is famous, and then some other uh, are, are famous uh, uh, in this line of work of trying to approximate the, the Wassenstein distances uh, in various numerical ways. And the question is, is, is it really good for analyzing shapes? And, and you should be the judge of it. I mean, you should look at the results and, and say whether you can do uh, better in comparing shapes uh, using this kind of measure compared to other to alternative measures. So these are questions that you should ask ourselves as students. You would not put me and uh, uh, tell bad or good things about my colleagues. I mean, these are great. Uh, directions to explore. I wouldn't say that any of them, including my uh, results, are something that you could uh, close the door after and say, look, this is the result of the book. This is the best you can do, and you cannot do any better. So this is still, this is why it is still an open research area. And I hope, I hope we will be able to solve it and move on uh, in the near future. But if not, then you will have a lot of work to do. Thank you for your answer. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Let's thank the speaker. Uh, thank thank you. you very much. Uh, just a few announcements. Um, so uh, in two weeks, you will, uh, there will be a meeting for the first year students to uh, give uh, useful information.